and welcome back to Vox Popcast, the weekly pseudo accurate roundtable of pop culture and nonsense with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co-hosts, Hannah and Katya and Wayne. How's it going, guys? Hey, Mav. I had a nice donut today, so that was a highlight. That's good. That's good. Uh, That's good. Hi. Uh, because I'm currently in the greater Portland metro area, uh, my parents picked up Buddha Donuts in celebration of their first vaccine, so I had a maple bacon bar, and I can Ooh, feel my good. arteries clogging as we That's That's good. I feel like we eased past the voodoo part. <laughs> voodoo Donuts? Is that just uh, like a... <laughs> yeah, Voodoo Donuts is like a Portland staple since okay. <laughs> for a very long time at this point. Um, they yeah. used to make donuts with NyQuil in it um, until the CDC said, uh, please don't. <laughs> Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, far be it for me to just like be big government, but I'm 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 kind of on their side there. Donuts with Nyquil. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, what? it was like you a Nyquil like jelly. Was- there was one that was made with like I think like a caffeine supplement at one point, and they were like concerned that it would cause you know problems. And People then getting course, addicted Ryan- to donuts. No. <laughs> well, and then of course like <laughs> people started drinking energy drinks, and I think that became a moot point. It was something about having that much energy in a solid form, I guess, as opposed to liquid that's somehow sort of settling. <laughs> um, but yeah, voodoo donuts. I mean, also like we have the voodoo doll donut, which comes with a little usually pretzel spear stuck in its heart. So that's nice. We had a whole format for this show today, but I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, all, I'm okay with throwing the topic off and just deconstructing this Nyquil donuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we will. Okay, let, let me, let me. Uh, apparently, they also had weed, weed donuts. Well, it's it's, uh, it's Portland. I mean, also, okay. Also, penis donuts, but that's less. You know, that's that's more. See again, we're, you're you're just you're saying words that just make me have more and more questions. <laughs> what I want to know is how do we franchise this in Pittsburgh? I want to know. She just said penis donuts, but you know that's normal. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> I grew up in Portland. This is all very normal to me. I, well, food shaped like penises. I, I mean, that, that, sure, right. Yeah, you know. Okay. This, is, this was like a thing. Okay, so this is it's Voodoo Donuts in Portland. It's like a famous donut shop, like Food TV Network. I think people knew about this. Like Food TV Network has covered this multiple times because people think this is cool. Like, yeah. So they have like penis donuts that are, of course, cream filled. Of course they are. <laughs> See, of course they are. My my personal favorite is the Loop Donut, which is covored in fruit. Okay. See, I, mean, I can see that. It's just and I cool. Like it doesn't it doesn't taste good because I, I think it was like supposedly inspired by one of the founders, like kid getting sick. So it's supposed little. to be medicinal. You're like you're supposed to be able. Oh, I'm. I you know. Yeah, I, like I have a runny cool nose. One. Let me go get some. It, it, it's like hiding food. It's like hiding medicine and dog food, right? There's so many. I mean, kind I was, of. I'm pretty sure that the the medicine ones we they were like served with a the actual prescription like cup whatever filled with the, the dosage in the middle of the donut hole. These were also like I I've never actually seen them in real life because I'm pretty sure that they were that, that yeah that was yeah. that was not cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to announce that I had my my first in my, my first COVID vaccination, but I don't care. I mean, I just I'm very fascinated by all of this now. You, you didn't get it with a donut, did you? No, no, this they just like, stuck a needle in my arm. This is like a normal part of Portland. I don't know. I thought this was normal, but apparently not. Okay. No, no. That, There's also I, a Tang donut. That's fun. <laughs> Are you just looking at a list? <laughs> no, I'm just remembering the donuts that I've eaten before. I'm just thinking yeah, about they, it. Yeah, do they ship stuff out? Because I may have to do this. I- I'm I'm sure they do, or I I don't know. She can, she can mail you check Gold Belly. Did you know? Do you guys know about Gold Belly? It's like Grubhub, but like all over the country with like forty dollars shipping. So like you can get know. a lobster roll from like Maine, but like you're I, gonna pay I like enjoy most for it. I don't know if it's forty dollars shipping worth of voodoo. I mean, just, <laughs> I will say this: I, I like voodoo just because it's like a you know it's a it's a it's an institution in Port, just, Portland and it's weird. I don't I I would not say that they are exceptional donuts. They're just weird, you know. They're good. But I'm thinking like, you know, you like Wayne and Katya know each other. You have each other's phone numbers. Can't he just like PayPal you like 30 bucks and say, <laughs> mail me some donuts? <laughs> I don't know if like they I'm would sorry. survive well, if I'm honest. Like, these are donuts that have to be eaten like day of or they get a little sad. Uh, Apparently, Voodoo Donuts is no longer available on Gold Belly. Uh, so I guess <laughs> the orders. I guess that's not an option for those of us who have never experienced we should move on. <laughs> so I feel like this is the opposite. So this response is the exact opposite of uh, the response. How do we move on? I don't yeah. know. I'm There's trying. No, I'm trying I, right now. Go, it's the opposite it. of the thing we're 
about to talk about. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was my topic, and I got you well. Know, what was Wayne's topic? I just uh, yeah. I just added to it. So, <laughs> Wayne, what are we talking about today? <laughs> well, I, well um, <laughs> donuts. Apparently, no. Uh, no I, well, just we're going to talk about what everybody else has been talking about for weeks, and and we debate about whether we should talk about it since everybody else is, and then it just keeps happening, and it's in our wheelhouse. So we're going to talk about it. the whole cancel culture thing. Um, also, to be fair, I've, this has been on our like list of episodes to do. I feel like for over a year, we've just like that's true. We kept canceling it. We kept canceling <laughs> it. We did because it's 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 kind of ex- much like cancel culture itself. It's kind of exhausting and doesn't feel very productive. Yeah, yeah. And, th- and that's our episode for tonight. Come. <laughs> so, what is cancel culture? How do we define cancel culture? What? what? Why? Why is it happening? That's why I wanted to do it. So we see I've seen a lot of articles lately of of the one thing that we were going to say originally, which was, is anybody ever really canceled? And and and, uh, you know, all the, all the conservative states will say, yes, they're canceled. The liberals were canceling everybody and all the liberal people will say, no, no one's ever really canceled. That's not true. Some people have been effectively canceled. Most of them know. But well, I, I think um, I, I think the, the, the more interesting thing is discussing the culture of what cancel culture is like from an actual cultural studies point of view, not from the, Oh, you know, should we get rid of Gina Carano? Yes. The answer is yes. She was a horrible person. So bye. You know, <laughs> like, I think it's more, what, what would it mean for canceling to be effective? Like, does that person well, need to, does that person like need to disappear from let's let, I mean, often we're talking about people that work in entertainment, although not always, but does that mean, you know, Harvey Weinstein never works in this town again? And then that's what successful canceling is. Or is it Harvey Weinstein takes a big enough of the hit that change in some kind of nebulous conception happens and then we're OK with something, maybe? Or like, like what? I, I guess I guess it's like, is it is it like because the way people talk about it on Twitter and like online is sort of like canceling. I'm never supporting this person again. No one should ever support this again. If you support this person, you're you're dead to me. Your family's dead to me. Go jump off a cliff. Mm-hmm. So so I I did some reading before the episode um and meredith clark um did a um like history of the term cancel culture and she says quote canceling is an expression of agency a choice to withdraw one's attention from someone or something whose values in these action or speech are so offensive one no longer wishes to grace them with their presence time or money has since evolved into journalistic shorthand wielded as a tool for silencing marginalized people who have adapted earlier resistance strategies for effectiveness in the digital space. And Clark, like, like Clark's premise is that the term originated, um, like in like black Twitter, um, Mm -hmm. and then has since sort of been used by a lot of people in different ways from which it began. And, and now we're here. I agree with her premise. I agree that it that that's where it originated. I agree that it was it it wasn't as it was never that official like five years ago, right? You, it was just a thing you say you're canceled. You know, it's just like you're done. It, it, it was an I'm done with you kind of statement. But her later point of it is sort of an acknowledgement that you are no longer giving this person your attention, your you, you know, your money. I don't I don't know that I believe that that is an effective thing anymore, because if anything, someone being canceled with quotes around them. I, you know, we, we don't do a video podcast, but just imagine that I put quotes, air quotes with my fingers around every time I use that term because I don't particularly like it. But being canceled at this point is essentially, you know, it gives you more cultural zeitgeist, if yeah. anything, right? Yeah, like more no coverage, one, yes. yeah, no one would be talking about Gina Carano outside of the of the Mandalorian season were it not for her getting canceled. No one's th- thought about these particular Doctor Seuss books in years. No one's, you know, Pepe Le Pew. Like people were worried about Pepe Le Pew being canceled. Honestly, when's the last time you watched a Pepe Le Pew cartoon? And by the way, we take, you know, we at Vox Popcast take take um, re- responsibility for that one because we called for him being canceled the week before he was. <laughs> Go us. I, I will uh, just also <laughs> say I I I um want to say that actually if you want to hear an analysis of cancel culture on a podcast, there's a podcast called Cancel Me Daddy, which um, 
will uh, say I've only listened to the first episode, but they do talk about how it's become a bit of a grifter culture. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, say, Josh Hawley. Uh, You remember Josh Hawley. Unfortunately, we all remember Josh Hawley. (laughs) And Ted Cruz. Um, Unfortunately, we cannot forget Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. I also feel like the most recent ra- like round of cancel culture things, like the Dr. Seuss's of the world, the Mr. Potato Heads of the world, which the fact that I'm talking about Mr. Potato Head even feels weird. Like, I mean, to Matt's point, actually, I haven't thought about Mr. Potato Head since the last like, Toy Story movie, and now I'm like, uh, you know, it's top of mind. Um, not that we're canceling Mr. Potato Head, but like we're canceling the people who are, I guess, mm-hmm. canceling Mr. Potato Head because it's a vicious cycle of everyone being enraged. Uh, but like the most recent round has been kind of fascinating to me because it's basically so it's it's well the case of Mr. Potato Head was basically Hasbro doing some you know marketing actually internal <laughs> rebranding. Yes. I mean, it's not even fully their marketing because basically all of the individual toy names are remaining the same. It's basically the un, it's like the, the the product brand that they all live under has changed just you know has changed which to me seems like such a minute detail for most consumers that it's like why are people even getting enraged right but it, also with the dr seuss things like to your point of like no one's been talking about these books for a long time no one's been buying them well, i and, mean and, and I, I think there's something that there's this you know capitalist motive on the part of exactly, the, the seuss what, estate yeah. as well they have warehouses of unsold copies of these books. If that had gone out of print and not said, said anything, nobody would have cared. Ned still had a warehouse full of books. But by announcing this, knowing it was going to cause a furor, mm-hmm. people, people rushing out and buying this, they've sold out of this stuff. So they, they yeah. cleared out their warehouse, made some money on stuff that they hadn't sold in years. Mm-hmm. And lots of people have quote unquote collector's items now that they'll never be able to get rid of. Uh, so they're, they're just a, a really cynical money grab. It's also just the like part of it. These companies are responding to the fact that like the demand for these things has has changed. Like, yeah, people people mm-hmm. haven't yeah. been buying those Dr. Seuss books because like well, they're culturally like be- because of the cultural issues. Mm-hmm. I mean, also they're just not as popular and like, generally. Me, but like people, but people so are, think things go out of print all the time and nobody cares. Nobody right. notices. Not every exactly. book that's been published is still in print. I read a novel when I was twelve years old. It was a best-selling book in nineteen seventy, whatever it was, called "The Reincarnation." of peter proud i bet you a dollar it's not in print and hasn't been in years right right and so like and, and, this and is nobody like, noticed you know this particular rap like this this particular like current iteration of the last you know couple weeks at this point like it's not really cancel culture it's just like the mar- it's, it's companies responding to market forces it's the right. free market <laughs> right and that's and that was my thing right like i I mean, if you are a conservative who believes in the free market and is bothered by canceling, what would you have the Dr. Seuss people do? Publish something against their will that's not selling? Like, like, what is the? Because they're not really, and they know this, right? There, you, you, yeah. um, Hannah, you said there. It's you know, there's a grift, right? Ted Cruz is is making money off this. It's, it's a political football, at this right? Point. Yeah. Cruz is, oh, and, that, and that's kind of what I want to talk about because because Cruz is currently fundraising based on the help Ted Cruz and Dr. Seuss fight cancel culture. You can send him sixty bucks, and he will autograph a copy of Green Eggs and Ham, a book that sells for four dollars and ninety seven cents on Amazon, and, and, and he's he also not got banned. And is not right. one of the ones that, hit, and it's not even banned. Again, yeah, you're right, you're right. just that stopped wrong, wrong printing this. Yep. It, is, it is banned in the exact same way as Amazing Spider-Man number 287. Right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's out of print. It's a book that, that one of my favorite comics. I think I got the number right. Um, um, but, um, but if you didn't, you will clearly be canceled immediately by all the yeah. time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, it doesn't matter. I was going to say, this was one of my favorite comics. Well, it's, when, it's when, also, when it's, it's, well, it's okay, well, extra well, grifty because it's well, like, this is cancel culture. Even if you believe that cancel culture is a problem, it's not a political issue. It's not something that Ted Cruz has any control over whatsoever. Right, right, right. He is not Dr. the Seuss god of the internet. He might, I guess he might think he is. I don't know. The Dr. Seuss people decided they did not want to sell anything. They could have easily kept selling it. They chose not to. It was canceled in the same way that that McDonald's cancels the McRib like twice a year. Like they and they can bring it back at any point. The Mr. Potato Head people literally have changed nothing other than the fact that they expanded the brand so they could make more toys. You know, you know, like they're they're still selling Mr. Potato Head. If you are actually a devotee of Potato Head brand, why would you not want more Potato Head? Right. And, so and, it, and as, as a child, I remember having a cucumber and a carrot. The brand used to be much more diverse. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just yeah. saying. Well, so so it makes it makes no sense. And it's just at this point, I would say there is a cancel culture, not because Mr. Potato Head is canceled, not because Dr. Seuss is canceled, but because Ted Cruz can enter the cultural zeitgeist by whining about Dr. Seuss being canceled. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, like the culture is talking about it more like, you, you know, again, are the Dr. Seuss people making less money? Not really. They're, you know, if anything, they're making more and probably stable. And the Mr. Potato Head people say anything. Gina Carano is probably in more demand than she was going to be otherwise, but to a smaller audience, uh, you know, like she's, it's not like she was winning Oscars, right? Like she was, she was third billing on the Mandalorian after Pedro Pascal and a puppet, you know, so, so, so which was a good gig and she, you know, frankly deserved to get fired for the kinds of stuff she did. So, so fine. And and, and also this whole thing of, you know, it's a company we can fire you. If you don't represent what we believe this country represents, it is our right to fire you. Or just like, we just don't feel like it. I mean, you're an at will employee, like unless there's something in your contract that stipulates. Well, that's what was so interesting about the whole Mandalorian thing. Well, first of all, she like apparently had warnings from Disney um, before she got fired. Uh, And secondly, what freaked people out about that from what I saw on Twitter or, you know, people use as use this as a reason to talk about is that, yeah, um, there aren't a lot of protections in the U.S. for employees. Um, You Mm -hmm. can just kind of get fired. Um, And then like you're, you know, a normal person, that means you might lose your health insurance or Mm -hmm. other benefits and also your salary where which you need to like eat and (laughs) stuff. So I think. I I really appreciated like the two days where we had a real conversation about labor in this country. And then like that went away and we got Ted Cruz. Did it really last for two days? Cause I, I did. I mean, yes, I agree with you, but I think that we didn't really have that conversation as much as we should have, because again, what I called in the blog, cancel culture, culture, you know, the culture of talking about cancel culture, that became the story. The story wasn't, the story was talking about should she be canceled or not in this nebulous meta kind of, kind of way, as opposed to discussing at all anything that happened to her, which was really nothing. She wasn't under contract at the time. They didn't even fire her. Her contract had expired. And then they were like, and they're like, we're not renewing you because you're kind of an asshole. Like that was, and it's not even clear happened. that they were had there were plans to renew her anyway. We don't know, but in all, I mean, there was another show that was being that is being pitched that by the description of it sounds like they had intended for her to be the star, but they never said she was going to be. Sure, but uh, what I'm saying collected. is like there, yeah. like no promises seem to have been made, or at least right. not publicly. Right, I mean, so they just it, didn't it, give her a job. They chose right. to not give her a job, and she Which, said some awful stuff. So capitalism. Good. Yeah, I mean that's that's how yeah. that's how things work. But like, I mean, the other thing is, it's also by talking about cancel culture. Like, I mean, this is this is I think true, particularly of like the Mandalorian example. But like, also, I think of Ted Cruz and, and the Doctor Seuss issues of the world. Is it allows you to basically focus it, it, it focus on cancel culture so that we don't actually talk about the issue at hand, like hand, like we're not talking about the way that you know some old Doctor Seuss books are racist. We're talking about cancel right. culture instead. Mm. And, and so, okay, so mm-hmm. I will take Mulberry. So I've read all of the, all, all six of the books that were canceled, by the way, mm-hmm. I have read. Um, the reason is because when I was, when I was a buddy, we little maverick, um, <laughs> the um, uh, a girl who, um, a neighbor girl who was like 13 or 14, who babysat me sometimes when I was like two and lived across the street, she bought me a book subscription to the books of Dr. Seuss or something when I was like two. Right. So I had all these books as a child um i remember actually liking mulberry street a lot when i was two in 1976 i went back and grabbed a pdf of it and read it last week and it was like oh okay yeah i see why there's a lot of rhyming words in this i see why i enjoyed this when i was two is it better than any of the other very simplistic poems that dr seuss writes not really um, and in fact, it's worse in many ways because it's literally his very first book. So it's, you know, he's not as refined as he would be. But again, he's Dr. Seuss, right? It's not it, it's not like I was going to go and read this book again ever were right. it not, not for this event not like, happening. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it's not it's not like like 
Hemingway or something. Right. And frankly, the, you know, how racist is it? It is somewhat racist. Um, somebody was asking me, was like, well, I heard that Dr. Seuss said a lot of problematic things and he did. And, and somebody, and this mm-hmm. random person who likes to argue this conservative person who likes to try and do gotcha stuff on my Facebook, but she's not very smart. Um, so she'll, she'll argue with people all the time. He's like, well, well, how about this? You know, you don't, you just, you just don't know how racist Dr. Seuss was. And I'm like, yes, I am aware of Dr. Seuss's history. I know. And, and frankly, here's how racist Dr. Seuss was. Dr. Seuss was is exactly as racist as you would expect a white man born 115 years ago to have been <laughs> like right. that's that's what he was and like he and was all, and, and all that like doctors like like you know the state of dr seuss like no longer choosing like no longer choosing to print these books it's just like the world has moved on right these books no longer sell yes. well because they no longer connect with people's you know interests values yeah. whatever it is or people just i mean honestly i think I don't even know if it's necessarily people have evolved past the, you know, the problematic books or whatever. I think it's just other titles are more popular. And so you buy, you buy like the four books that are more popular and everyone else reads. Right. You're going to read, you're going to read, you're going to read the Grinch. You're going to read the Sneetches. You're going to read Cat in the Hat. Mulberry Street is literally a story about a boy walking down the street and seeing stereotypes. That's it. And a couple of the stereotypes, the, the, the Chinese boy, which used to say a China man, they changed it. Like they did edit it in the eighties. They changed it. And they, and, and he saw some African natives, which were basically monkeys. That was it. So is it racist? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, but it's not like it's it's not like it says anything mean about them. Yeah, it like, just what uses, year was that published? 1939. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's exactly what you would expect out of a 1930. Yes. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in children's literature, so I could be totally wrong. But it's probably yes. on par I, with I mean, it's on par with a lot of the pulp stuff that's mm-hmm. why well, we, 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 can cer- that we can certainly show you comic books <laughs> yeah yeah sure. and it's, it's, it's exactly and to i mean so wayne speaking of comic books right like the spirit was by modern standards pretty racist by yeah. standards of the 80s pretty racist to the point that will eisner one of you know for for our listeners who are not as comic book historians as Wayne or I are, but like um, you'll know the name Jack Kirby. Will Eisner is just as important. Yeah. And Will Eisner, before he died, was appalled by what he'd done <laughs> with some of, with some of his his early work and worked to try and change it. Yep. And and, and his only excuse, and it wasn't an excuse, was this is what everybody did. Right. It was part of the culture of the time. Mm-hmm. We didn't know any better. And Doctor Seuss I similarly know. did that. Mm-hmm. Doctor Seuss similarly did that in the eighties before he died. He was yeah. just like, yeah, some of my old, older stuff was not great. You know, it was kind of insensitive. I didn't know at the time. And you know, good for him for evolving. Right. So, I mean, if, if the things that you did when you were like in your you know twenties seem great to you when you're in your eighties, I, I question what you have done with <laughs> doing sixty in years. In right. Like. <laughs> Growth is a good thing. Admitting that maybe that decision you made some some time ago is not the best is mm-hmm. a, is, is a positive thing in my mind. Yep, yep. Which I think is the other aspect of of like cancel culture. So like, I mean, the example I brought up at the beginning of Harvey Weinstein is maybe not a good one because I think Harvey White like that's that's a pretty extreme example in terms of like this is somebody that in an ideal world I would prefer not to ever work again in Hollywood because in an ideal world, well, Weinstein should be in prison. Right. You know, no, exactly. Weinstein right. raped quite a few people is what it comes down to. Yeah. So, But like, I wonder about cases where somebody is canceled and like there's good like there's good reason for them to be called out publicly. Like who? Give me an example. I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is Aziz Anasari. OK, like because basically uh, I don't remember the details off of my top of my head at the moment, but basically he was called out and like rightfully so for yeah. basically like he had been he had been basically joining the Me Too conversation and was called out with basically like, hey, here's some here's some things that you made me feel on a romantic encounter that were not OK. He's a weird one, though. He's a weird one because he fought back for like two minutes and then he was That's like, wait thing. a minute. I, and, he, and, and, then, and, and, then he, and then he figured out. Presumably because also a lot of people were yelling at him on the internet of sort of like, bro, you're in the wrong. And he was like, oh yeah, actually I'm, I'm being an awful person. And Mm -hmm. at least made attempts to be like, okay, like I'm trying, I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to like make some amends and at least puts, you know, and and I think a lot of people have questions about like how genuine was it, et cetera. But I will also say like, you know, even, even his, some of his, his up like tries to call out toxic masculinity and like other things. So it's like, 
And it, so, to the point of also making fun of himself occasionally. Do I think he's a pariah? Uh, or like, do I think he's a shining example of, you know, I don't know. Do, do well, okay, so, doing the best. So I have a question though. I think you, I think you hit on something there. Because, um, so I'm, I'm going to contrast him slightly with, um, I'm going to get put pick three comedians, all of whom have been quote unquote canceled for one reason or another. Right. So you've got Aziz, you've got Louis CK and you've got Dave Chappelle. Right. So in in Aziz's case, Aziz got called out. He did. Like I said, he did fight back briefly um, and then he listened. He has addressed it in serious ways and in his comedy. Um, and in, and you even just, you even just mentioned it like sort of in passing, you said, how, how sincere is he about it? Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's questions about his sincerity, but at the other hand, like he's at least trying to respond to it in a way that a lot of people wouldn't. Right. So I, I, I think the problem with me, for, with me of being like, oh, well, like just say he's outright canceled. If we're talking about canceling means this person never works in this town again, I'll, you know, as right. the cliche <laughs> goes, like that doesn't really allow for growth. So like, okay, like at least this person, and I've actually had, weirdly, uh, on like first dates, I've had like guys bring up that entire, watching that entire thing of Aziz yeah. Adasari, like dealing with it publicly as like the thing that woke them up to like, hey, maybe I should like think about feminism more. Sure. And so in some ways I'm just like, okay, like, was this a growth moment? I still don't know how to feel about it. Well, and I think maybe it's just because I don't like cancel culture in general. I find kind of weird. Well, you said, what is it? And I think that's the weird thing, right? Cause okay. So with Aziz, he did address it. I've seen, I've seen a one-on-one -on -one interview. I can't remember who interviewed him, but I've also seen his comeback special where he talks about it in depth um apologizes publicly right and um i actually think it's a really good i actually think it's a really good special i like it a lot is he sincere or not i can't read his mind i don't know but i think that to the extent that canceling is a thing at all right i mean not cancel culture culture that that i was talking about earlier but to the extent that he can be canceled he's got a career so he so he's, he clearly wasn't just he didn't lose his career over it but mm -hmm. he has lost some fans there are people who are never going to give him another chance um and i don't think they should have to you know we did no, a whole milkshake not. yeah we did a whole milkshake duck episode about like you don't you know you like who you like if you're willing to like problematic people fine if you're not that's fine too but he did take a hit for it. And there are some people who would have him not have the opportunity to grow. So a lot of the think pieces that um, from the left, from our side, my side, at least, but I'd say our our side, everybody on the show are. Oh, no, there's no such thing as canceled. No one has ever canceled. That's not entirely true. I mean, people like, definitely are, take, he took a career hit. I mean, yeah, he took a massive career hit. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, I'm not saying he didn't deserve it. He, I'm just saying, let's not pretend that it's not there. It is there. It was probably deserved. But I also think that society and culture never get better if people don't get second or third or 18th chances. I, I think that, you know, it's important to know, like, I, I don't want to like judge his sincerity um right. but it's important to note i think in his case and in the cases of people who have made mistakes but haven't got quote canceled mm -hmm. uh in in certain ways they've apologized um because you know like we all make mistakes right like uh sometimes it's through what i've, I've heard this phrase a lot lately learned ignorance sometimes we just like ap apologies sincere apologies and taking responsibility for your actions and doing some sort of accountability, which looks different depending on what has happened, I think does go a long way as opposed to uh, like quite a few of these people deflecting or refusing mm -hmm. to engage. I, I mean, uh, someone, no one on this show actually cares about, but a lot of people care about that's been in the news recently is Chris Harrison, the host slash former host of The Bachelor. Oh, The Bachelor. Who, mm -hmm. who uh, was at least temporarily removed from his position because he tried to apologize for racism, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to get into the whole story. But so wait, we'll just backing up. He, Enough of it, yeah. Just to make sure that I understand, he was he he was fired because he attempted to apologize. He's not fired. He's not he, fired. This is very important. He, he stepped he was, down he was, and he's temporarily. And he's only temporarily. Yes. But, 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 yeah, let me let me rephrase that. Explain like the. There, there was a contestant on this season of The Bachelor, which also importantly featured the first Black Bachelor, who 
was seen in 2018 taking photos at a plantation party. And Mm -hmm. uh, he was asked about it on a podcast by Rachel Lindsay, um, who was the first black bachelorette. I think so. She was certainly a contestant. I think she she was a bachelorette too, wasn't she? I think. Yeah, yeah. And she she, she talks a lot, um, from what I understand, about races. And she asked him about it, and he was like, oh, well, like, are we judging this girl by 2018 standards or 2021 standards? So he didn't say it was racist. There's no excuse for this. He was like, why are we attacking her? What, 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 like, what is it? Was it really racist in 2018? And yes, plantation parties were racist in 2018, in case anyone was wondering. Like, racism wasn't invented last year. (laughs) Racism was not invented last year. That's correct. You can't see the face that I'm making at the question of are plantation parties racist? And I just <laughs> like the entire premise of them existing is be- okay. Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds had a plantation wedding. And they apologize for that, and they are certainly not canceled. They both have careers. Well, they've apologized for it and they've donated a bunch of money because they feel guilty. They're we but in- so in the girl's case, I don't know. I don't know the girl who um, she because she won the season of The Bachelor. She actually ended up winning. And then they broke up because once he fa- once The Bachelor found out about it, he's like, because The Bachelor was a black dude and she won. And he's like, oh, oh, no, no, no. So uh, I don't think it is just because she took the pictures. It's also because she didn't understand. Right. Which seemed like of a piece. Well, but also she does. <laughs> This is weird. We're getting real. I did not expect this bachelor conversation. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not a big fan of the show, but I I'm a fan of culture. So like I've I've been following this. Right. And she did um, as we record the um, episode aired two nights ago, I think. Mm-hmm. But she, I've seen the footage of her addressing it and she does seem to sort of understand it now. And again, I can't judge somebody's sincerity. She appears to be trying she appears to be trying a lot harder than Harrison was when he tried to defend her because he came across as a jackass. She, she, she came across as look, this is how I was raised. I didn't know better. I didn't know I was hurting anybody. I'm very sorry. Now, was she saying it for TV or was she saying it for real? I don't know, but she, but that's what she said. He said, why is everybody getting it all up in arms about plantation parties? Come on. It's just the thing that's different. And, and he's, apparently working on himself now where he's like trying to investigate and trying to come back. I don't know much about him because I don't watch the show other than, you know, when something controversial like this happens, but that's a difference. Right. And I think the difference is uh, I mentioned earlier, like Louis CK, right? Louis CK didn't try. He, you know, he basically said, Oh, well, I didn't realize it was bad to force somebody to watch me masturbate. That's his apology. And like, and then he, and then continue like the to make jokes about it. The premise of that is just so questionable. Right. It's, I mean, I, we all know that, but it's just like, ah, okay. Right. And now he's continued to make jokes about it and have a career about it. That's just, he's like, oh, I guess this is my career now. And, you know, fine. You can have a career like that, I guess. So I understand why people don't forgive him. But then, like, I think that, I think well, his, that, his career just became a different thing where it's like, right. presumably, it, he now has, I would assume his audience is now the people who are the cancel culture culture people. Right. Right. And mm-hmm. sure. And, but like, there are people in the, there are people in the middle. Um, Chappelle is my favorite example. I understand why Chappelle's not for everybody, right? Um, I'm a fan. I am personally a Dave Chappelle fan. I very much like a lot of his work. Do I agree with everything he does? No, but I, but I do enjoy him. The thing that, that he took flack on was he made some jokes about LGBTQ people, um, that some people were offended by. He was talking about a specific transgender friend of his who was in the audience at the time. He was telling a story about someone who, you know, knew, knew the act, right? So she wasn't mad. And does that mean that other people can't be mad? No, but like there is a segment of people who don't want nuances. You're either all good or you're all bad. And I think life has to be more complicated than that. And I think what ends up happening is we get so the reason I called it cancel culture culture. We get so wrapped up in the idea of what canceling is and the conversation of culture that no one actually even remembers what Chappelle said, right? Like, you, like it doesn't right. matter anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, or most people don't remember what Aziz did. Aziz, people are like, people probably think Aziz Ansari raped somebody. He did not. 
Um, and, and the woman who accused him did not say he did. What she said was like, what she accused him of was pressuring her to go further than she wanted to. And then she said, okay, because she felt pressured. And he said, and his, and his defense is, oh my God, I'm sorry. I didn't know I did that. I should do better now, which is as good as you can hope for. I think, I mean, he shouldn't have done it. I'm not saying he shouldn't have done it, but, but that's like, that's the story, but it became a much bigger story, right? Because people want it to be a binary issue. And I don't think that, I think that if you actually look at the Aziz story, you can have a very important conversation about the nature of informed consent. Which I think like is kind of the reason why, I mean, I wasn't an avid watcher of his stand-up before. I wasn't, I'm not really a watcher of, like, not a particular right. fan before, but not a particular fan afterwards. It was just basically, I watched this and I was sort of like, mm, I've seen you be funny sometimes. Right. But I mean, I think in some ways it's like, I, I gotta like commend the guy for at least trying to have that conversation and trying to do better and doing it publicly and at least anecdotally based off of my experience. I've seen a lot of guys who, you know, come from backgrounds or, or families or communities where, like, having nuanced conversations, uh, particularly among men, about mm-hmm. what consent means wasn't happening. And so that was the first time, like, they were, like, literally have had, like, a, like now at least three separate people on separate occasions, like, talk to me about, like, that's how they learned about it, like, how to how start having these conversations. And I'm like, that's, I mean, whatever you think about Aziz, <laughs> in, huh? Yeah, that's, yeah right? you're like, that's good, I guess. That's good. Like, so, like, whatever I, like, which is why it's like, okay, whatever I, Whatever I feel about Aziz, honestly, like personally, I mean, I don't know him or follow his work enough to feel like I have a super more opinion, but like at least the evidence suggests that in some ways, like he, like not saying he should have done what he did, but like Mm -hmm. to your point, like he at least responded probably as, as well as could be expected given the particular circumstances. And it seems like there's at least some positive benefits over the way that he responded Mm -hmm. as opposed to say, yeah, like the Louis CK kind of like style. I mean, and the other thing I think that those, those examples bring to that kind of like bring to mind is I think part of cancel culture is also like whether or not you are someone who would say that the person being canceled, it's whether or not you're willing to lean into it Mm -hmm. because Louis CK, Louis, like from what I know, like, about his his whole experience and his comedy and his particularly your description is it sounds like he's leaning into like okay this is my life now this is this is my audience now and this is what we're just going to go with so you know I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and it'll appeal to the people it appeals to which is maybe different than who it appealed to before whereas like eighty percent overlap like, <laughs> probably, right probably. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then, like, it, if I had to guess, I would assume a significant portion, if not the majority of Anasari's, not that the significant majority is necessarily people trying to cancel him, but mm-hmm. I would be willing to bet that if he leaned into being canceled, that right. might not be the audience that he would have personally want based off of what I know about his public persona. Right. His 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 mm-hmm. material. To, he's not the, he, he's not super political, but to the extent that he's political at all, his material leaned much more left always and like he you know so he he was attempting to be woke if for lack of a better term in his comedy to start with so he couldn't like if he was going to lean into i'm the cancel by i'm the bad boy like that would have been completely reinventing himself in a way that he wouldn't have been able to um outside of that case even assuming that he could have like there's a question of whether or not he would have wanted to right right so you know like i do think that there's again to the extent that anybody has ever scare quote canceled at all i i think that I think that what we're really talking about is cultural forces sort of bringing about change by having conversations. Um, the reason you know, to get back to like my culture culture thing where the reason I wanted to have this conversation is because I think that I think that there's a point when we go beyond the talking about the canceling, talking about consent, talking about LGBTQ rights, talking about using the N word or whatever somebody has been canceled for talking about Andrew Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo right now. The conversation is, should he resign or not? versus has he been canceled and people are forgetting that the issue is maybe he sexually harassed people maybe he hid the deaths of a lot of people like he's got some really big issues and we're talking and the conversation becomes about oh is it just a witch hunt and you know sometimes it is uh, the, we could talk about the james gunn thing right that was a witch hunt and it was something he did and he responded too well but in the andrew cuomo um situation the things he's being re- accused of are very big deals. 
mm-hmm. and we're ignoring it, mm-hmm. you know, to, to have the fight about to have the meta fight in a way. Not everybody. I mean, certainly the women who are accusing him of sexual harassment are not ignoring this issue. Right. But the question is often becoming, should he or should he not be canceled? And, I mean, I mean, this is this particular example, I think, also aligns with Trump, um, mm-hmm. with, with Kavanaugh, with with, you know, uh, like to some degree, uh, Josh Hawley and those who support the insurrection. Like, I, I feel like there's a conflation mm-hmm. uh, when people talk about canceling because like like the, the do- Dr. Seuss deciding not to print books is not the same. This um, Dr. Seuss as, also doesn't print my book. So, you know, <laughs> they can, they which, can do that. Which, you know, like. <laughs> Like if it's all, you know, cancel culture, then like it, it, um, makes it sound less serious. Um, uh, the word I'm searching for is escaping my brain. Um, but you know, it, it makes it, it makes it less serious. We, if we don't talk about the issue and we just use cancel culture, there's no hard conversation. And I think that a lot, maybe like the, the reason, yeah, 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 exactly. And the, the reason, yeah, because the reason right. a lot of people don't want to talk about this is because I, I mean, especially when it came to the insurrection, right? Like mm-hmm. if Trump was held accountable, then what would happen to Cruz, Holly, mm-hmm. Cindy Hyde Smith at all? Um, mm-hmm. And it, I mean, it's also like interesting with political figures too, because it plays itself out unequally because there there can be a lot of pressure to resign. Like look at the Virginia several years ago um, mm-hmm. when it when it was discovered that he um, had, there were photos of him in blackface. Uh, mm-hmm. Look at you know Josh Hawley and all the newspapers calling for him and Ted Cruz to resign, and, mm-hmm. and then look at like <laughs> and yet Al Franken, Al Franken actually did yeah. Al Franken. Yeah. Um, and which is, I, I am not here to defend Al Franken. I'm just saying that, you know, like sometimes the power dynamics play out in such a way that are, are like the values of certain parties. Like it, it just seems to apply unequally, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And I think the meta fight allows it to be. <laughs> If you if you make it always about cancel culture and not about the specific issue, then it becomes a, a political weapon, not even just with actual, you know, capital P politics like you can you can argue like if you're talking about Weinstein, right? Weinstein was literally accused of rape of capital R rape. That is what he's been accused of. It's a problem. Bill Cosby is literally convicted of capital R rape. <laughs> like that is <laughs> that is something that Bill Cosby is in prison for today and canceling literally, you know, pulling his TV show off the air. I have complicated feelings about it. I understand why people did it, but the the fact that the Cosby show it can't get syndicated anymore is a problem for other people who are making their money that way, who had nothing to do with it. So I understand that complicated issue. Then you compare it to someone like James Gunn, who did say he say, okay, but James Gunn in his case made some off color jokes on Twitter that were not, I mean, they were not very funny. They were quite offensive. Um, and he made them years before he was really famous. He was just trying to be noticed and he apologized for them when he got the Disney job, when he got the Marvel job and, um, he apologized for them. He apologized in like, you know, several LGBTQ magazines. He did the tour. You know, he was like, I, I was not a great person. I was just trying to say smart ass stuff to get noticed. And then he went on and made the Guardians movies and everything. And then when he became critical of Trump, random right wingers dug up his old tweets, which had been deleted and started reposting them. Well, James Gunn says this. Is this your hero? Is this your hero? So he was canceled. He was yanked from his Disney project projects for something that he'd said in the past, for something he'd already apologized for, for something that he's clearly a different person for, did not fight it. He said, you know what? That was me. That was my fault. I have no one to blame but myself. And he stepped away. Now, he did eventually get the job back, but the fight, the fight wasn't about no one who was complaining was honestly offended by by James Gunn. Right. They weren't. They were trying to they were trying to silence him because he was critical of Trump. And that's a problem because he did not rape anybody. He said some really offensive tweets. That's what he did. That was his big crime. And it becomes the same level, right? Like, how do you compare James Gunn to to Harvey Weinstein? I don't think you mm-hmm. can. I, I and, don't think you should. We did. Yeah, right. but we did. We did. You know, we acted like that was the exact same issue. Um, and I think that there I think that. <laughs> We sh- I think using the term, you know, being in a cancel culture culture allows us to 
short circuit things and make things nice, digestible 24 hour news cycle bites that probably shouldn't be. So I don't like that. (laughs) I don't don't know where else to go with that. I don't, I, you know, I, I think it's interesting to talk about and I think it's interesting that we should dissect it, but I don't like how, I don't like how we deal with it on any side. Yeah. No, just as you pointed out, I mean, that's, it's, that becomes a cover that becomes what the conversation is. It, it, it covers the real issues. It allows us to not talk more deeply about the issues. Mm-hmm. And it, well, it also feeds the rage machine. I mean, this is what right, we're seeing yeah. with the potato head quote unquote controversy and <laughs> all that stuff. Is it's like, I, the fact that we're even talking, like the fact that I can even utter the words "potato head potato controversy", head controversy yeah. is just let's just let's just reflect on this moment and the, the the past year and a half now. You can say it, and everybody knows what you mean. So that's right. that's why I said there is a cancel culture culture. It does exist because that's a thing that you can talk about just as easily as you can talk about, you know. I don't know, MCU or, mm. or, you know, I, but Kesha. I mean, the, you the, know? The, the potato head thing is to be particularly farcical because no one in any kind of documented, meaningful way was trying to cancel Mr. Potato Head. Right. I'm sure somewhere someone has found a Reddit thread or a Twitter thread from like a year ago where someone was talking about Mr. Potato Head. Like, I'm sure someone somewhere has said it, but there wasn't like a high profile conversation that in some way Hasbro was con- was was responding to. Well, it's all- literally like the outrage is responding to a void of nothing other than mm-hmm. angst over the fact that people, a growing number of people accept that gender heteronormativity is kind well, and, of dumb. And you know, part of the fun of the potato head line is the interchangeability of parts. You can put those fancy eyelashes on Mr. Potato Head. It's okay. Mr. Potato Head comes with fancy eyelashes. I would also the only difference is Mr. Potato Head comes with more actually, of them. Actually, removing the gender from Mr. Potato Head is technically more biologically accurate. Potatoes are in fact yeah. rhizomes. Yeah. yeah. I, I was, that's what I've been thinking this entire time. Just so you know, I've been yeah. thinking about rhizomes this entire time and how potatoes spawn. Um... Which is more than the listener wants to know, quite frankly. <laughs> I also, I, I've been thinking. Think deeply you know, about the gender of your potatoes the next time you're eating them, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs> um, you know, I, what I've been thinking is that um, when I was a kid, I remember the same kind, like the same, pe- actually, so, literally some of the same people, because like I can see what people are posting on Facebook um, now. Mm-hmm. The same people who were freaking out about like Harry Potter and like Pokemon and, you know, the like Disney and family values in like 90s and early aughts. They're the people also now freaking out about Dr. Seuss um, being quote canceled and Mr. Potato Head. And, I mean, I, I mean, I think it, I think it's, it's just too easy a point to they make to say burning, that like the Harry Potter books. Yeah. It, it, it's just it, the no, hypocrisy. No, they, of it. they were burning um, comics in 1947. You oh, know, yeah. they, like, yeah, they, they tried to cancel everything I've loved my entire life. You know, you know, <laughs> rec- records have been burnt, you know, like they blew up disco records in a, at a ball game in 1980. Uh, yes. The PMRC, led b- primarily by Democrats in, in the late 80s, the mm-hmm. Paris Music Resource Center, mm-hmm. attempting to not censor, but label records, which was in effect censorship oh. in terms of major change carrying them. Um, d d you know, mm-hmm. tarot Ritzel. cards, I, well, you know, glam rock, I, two well, live crew. I, you well, know, that, yeah, that's take, I was going to talk about that one. Because what's interesting about, I mean, can't uh, again we're we're using this like it's a new thing right so i i mentioned in in the blog i said something like meta hegemony right like we are talking about this as though cancel culture is just this thing that started in the last four years right like since since trump essentially and it's not in fact it has more often historically been a tool of the left in a weird way to where the left was canceled, was complaining about being canceled more often. Um, the two life crew thing is, is the example where that you talked about. And my, uh, my wife and I had this long conversation about, uh, about that incident. Cause she didn't know much about it. Um, she, she remembered when it happened, but she knew of the song, me so horny knew nothing else about Luther Campbell. Nobody knows anything about Luther Campbell, Luther Campbell, the lead singer of two life crew um, was attacked by Tipper Gore 
because Tipper came home one day and heard her daughter listening to a two live crew album, heard me so horny and decided to ruin a man's life over it. That's what cancel culture was. Uh, Campbell's response was, I only play shows that are 18 and over. And Tipper Gore followed the man around the country, picketing outside of bars that her teenage daughter would not have been able to get into and having him pulled, having his dates pulled because she didn't like this one song. And that becomes a problem, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you're when you're and, looking and, at stuff and yeah. eventually led to, led to Senate subcommittee hearings about labeling records and, and yes, which is where, records and, which is and where the parental stuff. advisory. Yeah, it's where right. the parental advisory label comes from. And it's it's no different than which we've talked about on the show many times before. Um People being afraid of, well, I don't want my kid reading these comics because maybe he'll become a rapist and gay. So let's um, put a code because, on it. So let's put a code on it. And that, and like you said, D&D, like you, we do this. Um, what, so what hegemony is briefly is when you seek control, the, I'm going to seriously simplify this. You are seeking to control thought through control of culture. And I don't like that. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and FCC rules, things you can't say on the radio, things you can't say on television. Right. All, all those movies I watched on Channel 4 in the 1970s that were right. edited. You know, I've talked before about you know, Cabaret having been edited to be incomprehensible, mm-hmm. would be my guess. And uh, because, never forget that the 18th mm-hmm. and 19th century also saw censorship, depending on like if you wanted to get into a circulating sure. library, and also people were like, novels, mm-hmm. girls mm-hmm. will have girls will have thoughts, and, and it will be <laughs> scary and, and and it will and they're useless mm-hmm. and that will make girls silly and it will interfere with their education because you know always always like being freaked out about like women mm-hmm. and their connections to culture because that's but so, right. yeah but, but somehow this doesn't get applied to canceling six million votes or canceling the right to vote <laughs> for however many people well it's different because that's not cultural right that's a that's fear it, it's a, it's that it's weird right like we worry more about controlling culture like cultural memes, like the things mm-hmm. that we that we study and talk about on this show most of the time. You know, we talk about politics and stuff, but mostly we're talking about funny books or movies and, and, or music or whatever. Right. Um, we worry more. We as a people worry more about policing media than we do about, again, the actual rape or the actual right. um, the actual like subjugation of of queer people or black people or women or you know like there like there are other things but we worry very much about well can we control these media appearances um you know canceling cancel culture as a term is almost always applied to celebrities where who have not who don't really have a lot of fear right like gina carano is gonna be fine where you really should be worried about being canceled is if you're a college professor or a truck driver or you work at a grocery store where you could do something and you really could lose your livelihood right like you know, like if you, if you have a black mark if you're like maybe uh, a racist or a rapist or a murderer <laughs> you know and good luck getting a job teaching right well, like people <laughs> you you say that though but there's been like many professors Right. That have been called out and accused of these same things and mm-hmm. and well, tenure pro- and, and tenure we'll can say, protect hey, you. Thank thank to, you tenure. To, to an extent to an extent. But okay, fine. So then it go then go down the ladder, right? Can you do it as a grocery store employee, you know? Or if you work in a factory? I mean I guess the thing is it's like it's it's well, there's a distinction between can you do the awful thing and will you survive getting caught? Well, you can survive getting caught is what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. yes, obviously you, because, you can do an awful thing. Sure. Right, <laughs> sure. Like, I, I, guess, I guess I just want to make that distinction clear because yeah. th- like those are very different instances. And yes, like, fair enough. I mean, for most companies, if you are a lower level employee, probably like so actually just to stay in academia, if you are a lowly adjunct adjunct like lecturer <laughs> which means you're a contract you're a contract employee you're not a mm-hmm. full-time employee of university would you survive getting caught for say like let, let's let's like assume that this this example it's it's you know sexually harassing graduate student right or something like that or saying racist I would be fired and rightly student. so if you were yeah if you were an adjunct <laughs> you would you would most likely be fired because i mean as ethics aside large aside but ethics aside you are a legal liability for the institute now, if you're a tenured professor, from the institutional perspective, the calculation might look different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you, if you are a much because, published tenured professor, well, yes. because I mean, we see, like, I mean, we've we've seen this play out in sort of like academics own version of Me Too, where people like talk about the fact that, like, if you you know, if you're prestigious enough, 
Mm-hmm. You know, people will start weighing, and this is this is where like you know believe believe like the whole like believing women slogan kind of comes in is or whoever is affected is not saving women, but uh, because if it's particularly because if you are in a position of power, the people who you are victimizing are most likely less prestigious than you are. Uh, it becomes a giant problem, which is mm-hmm. kind of like where in some ways cancel culture kind of comes in because it's basically leveraging. I mean, we've even seen it in, ac- in academia. I mean, there's some academics that I will not mention, but that they, there's been conversations about, like, in particular fields, like, we're going to stop citing this person. Like, this is a very important person to the field, but, like, mm-hmm. we're going to stop citing this person because. But even still, you're not mentioning them for a reason, right? Because you are not as powerful. <laughs> and, you right. Know. No, it's, well, that's what I'm saying yeah. is it's basically yeah. like can- cancel culture comes out of this desire for mm-hmm. creating collective power in the in the face mm-hmm. of the power of prestige or money right. or politics. So like it's not to say that there's there's not a utility that exists there, but I would say in most of most of the times where I see cancel culture, I mean you could even should go back to some of the like examples with comedians. Like you could make the argument that say the similar thing of like these people probably would not have like Aziz and Asari, like yes, he has a sort of like coming around moment, but like would he have had that coming around moment if hundreds, thousands potentially hundreds of thousands of people were basically saying like, ah, oh, you're kind of a horrible person. Uh, like, would he have responded in the same way? I mean, especially since he initially denies it. But like, I mean, I don't know. Cause, cause every- most of them don't. Right. Like I, maybe he would have, right. Because like, because most people who take the hit just wait it out. Well, there's basically no way for us to ever know because like, sure. I'm just comparing him to say Kevin Hart who took heat sure. and denied it until it went away. Right. And he didn't do anything. You know, he, he basically I, I said some horrible things. Is, yeah. is this, if, if the, basically the person who felt victimized by him confronted mm-hmm. him about it, would he have had the same response? I, I'm skeptical on that just because his, <sighs> initial, his initial public response is to say like, I didn't do that, which mm-hmm. makes me think that that probably like if there hadn't been this like massive upswelling of people telling him, no, actually you're wrong, that particularly mm-hmm. weren't the person he had already mistreated. I don't know if he would have come around basically. Like I think there is, you know, sure. and, and like I said, there's no way to know because we don't have the opposite person, you know, the opposite case, but like, I is mean, that the, I, I is that the natural, is that natural humanness, right? Like if he, if he honestly, assuming he honestly made a mistake and didn't know that he'd done anything wrong, right. As, giving him the benefit of the doubt. If he really didn't know, and one person says it, I think that, you know, and one person says to you, one person ever in your life, if it really just was one person who ever said you did something awful to me and you're not aware that you did it, I get why you might go, I would never do that. And then and so maybe the goodness of cancel culture is that 10,000 people said, dude, no, that's not cool. You know, like, is that the good point? I mean, but hey. the, I think I think I've, in talking about uh, like like institutions like universities or are just, mm-hmm. you know, academia in general or uh, the tech industry or our, our, our America. Like, I, I think cancel culture tends to focus on individuals or individual instances hey. for a set amount of time. And it's good to have accountability. We all should have accountability mm-hmm. and we all should learn and grow from our actions. But when the when the core of, say, I mean, just America, when the core is rotten, when, you know, the country is founded on values of white supremacy, when a lot of the general population has some form of learned ignorance about a whole host of like intersectional issues. What, you know, like how, how, like how is cancel culture also addressing structural problems? Um, because may, holding one person accountable in a bad system won't necessarily change the system. Um, right. Or, you know, not, and, and sometimes as we've discussed at length, people aren't held accountable and the system isn't formed much less replaced with something better burned to the ground insert your um <laughs> revolutionary active choice here um well i think that was kind of what we were talking about earlier in the episode is like in some in, in some respects like cancel culture has become its own system kind of i wouldn't say independently but its own system like propping up other bad systems because it's covering over right. us talking about <laughs> systemic injustice. I mean, and even like the outrage machine of individual people, even though, yes, there are, there seem to be some positive effects in terms of holding individual people accountable in some cases, it's still, we're focusing on those individual people rather than the actual problem of, you know, racial profiling or well, ignoring consent or whatever it is. So I have a question then, because I'm wondering if this is like our bright side, right? 
um if we're saying if we're saying cancel culture does that like it clouds the issue right uh and i think to an extent i mean i'm i said that very early on that it was this meta fight on the other hand to disagree with everything katja just said and with myself half an hour ago um you know pepe Le Pew did get canceled like the, the 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 right thing happened eventually after 70 years of cartoons right like i mean it like now is it is it just market forces is it just i mean from from my understanding of the scene that was cut from space jam 2 a movie which is entirely just a capitalist you know movie by committee anyway i've not seen it but i mean everything about this movie says this is just trying this is a movie about hey buy our ip and we're going to put this together in a movie um, I'll watch the hell out of that. So will I. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm there, but I'm just saying, I like, I, I'm not expecting high art from this. But my understanding is that the scene that was cut was a scene where Pepe Le Pew is a little too rapey, and LeBron James calls him on it, and is like, "Dude, no." And then eventually, they were just like, "You know what? We're just not going to do this." No one gives a shit about Pepe Le Pew. We're just taking that scene out of the movie, and he just won't be in the movie. And and was anyone that's- really that upset? I mean, other than the cancel culture, like people that are whatever like is Pepe Le Pew like someone's favorite character I've never met anyone who's super like yeah the weird skunk okay no. so no except so here's where I found that found it interesting and I've not been involved in this conversation I've just been watching uh my wife some relatives of hers and, and like high school friends and stuff have been discussing this and some people who are otherwise relatively liberal um and relatively you know women in in fact who certainly don't want to be raped. I'm just going to, I mean, I didn't ask, but I'm just going to assume are kind of upset about it. Most humans. Right. Right. I think it's, uh, uh, but like women whom I know not well, but whom I've met are saying, well, this is going too far. You know, we watch these cartoons, like there's a bit of, well, these were good enough for us and I didn't become a rapist. So how come we're making a big deal of this now? And it's not the same, right? It's not the same. Like it's not the point of like, Mm-hmm. Oh, like okay oh boy like, right but they are legit upset about it i'm just saying that there are people who there are people other than the also, other than the even, um the incels who are upset about it and, even assuming that that argument is true that like mm-hmm. i mean we've talked about this this show many times but in more nuanced conversation of whether or not media ideates certain kind of criminal mentalities or actions right. or whatever at length in many episodes i'm not going to go into that but like even if we assume that 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 is true that you know there's a different cartoon that that caused criminal behavior in another subset of children if that's the bar right it's on the floor <laughs> yeah like but, but I, it's not because it's because to me it's like it's not like no one like okay again i'm sure there's some kind of reddit dungeon where someone has made this argument but no one i think re- no, no reasonable person is making the argument that we should get rid of these these instances of, repre- of, of representation because it will make our children into felons. It's because yeah. it's like, no, these are distasteful, should not be normalized. And but that's how it's framed. Like, I think it is. I think it is framed. But I think it. I mean, I. I don't think it's no reasonable person. I think there are people who are making that argument. Um, they're wrong, but I mean, I think there are people who really who. Well, I would not count those people reasonable people because there's no right. evidence. And, but that's the conversation, right? The con- because the conversation they were having, people who are otherwise reasonable were like, well, I watched these and I ter- turned out just fine. And there's two parts. So first off, did you? Did you really turn out just fine? Like you're, you're self-assessing. But even assuming you do, you did. That's, you know, no, the, uh, these well, are people. Like, and and not, well, I'm not intending to psychoanalyze your, your you know, friends and family, but like, I guess this is OK. Be, becoming a, a cartoon making you a felon and you, quote unquote, coming out OK are two different things. Right. What does it mean? When we're talking about coming, like I came out OK, I think that's I mean, the, the, your question, Mav, about like, well, did you? Because yeah. I think that's an important, that's actually an important distinction because like, mm-hmm. well, because of that cartoon and many hundreds, if not thousands like it, we all grew up in what is now commonly referred to as rape culture. Right. Right. By that argument, actually, if you grew up in rape culture, we all currently still exist in it. You didn't come out all right. All right. Uh, in the same way that the rest of society that currently lives in that condition. Yeah, not just didn't you. Come out all right. Right. And, and even if you did, even if you did, it's just like, 
most people, okay, I am a weird nerd who literally has gone, has manipulated things for the last decade to make this my actual job, right? <laughs> it's to sit around and talk about this stuff, right? Which is amazing. Um, and like Hannah, you just said, you will absolutely watch Space Jam, right? But these are in, in Space Jam 2. I own and I'm going to watch Jam it. on Blu-ray. Right. I'm, I, I'm absolutely going to watch this on HBO Max when it premieres. But honestly, the people that I was watching this have a conversation and I didn't get involved at all. I've just I've just watched. These are people aged 30 through 50 something. You know, it's just a, it's a bunch of people having a discussion. And but for the few of them who have kids and not all of them, like none of them were going to watch this movie like none of them have you know they're not weirdo you know cultural studies people or just nerds like us who are sitting there like none of them have watched a looney tunes cartoon in 20 years because like, like, how would you have uh, <laughs> so they're they're upset at the idea it's it's an attack right if if the feeling is well you know what i used to laugh at pepe Le Pew cartoons when i was 10 so now that i'm 40 if you're saying something's wrong with pepe Le Pew, then you're saying something's wrong with me for having laughed at Peppy Love You. Okay, so I I have something to say about this that's sort of off track, but I think might take us somewhere interesting, or maybe not, and you can mm-hmm. cut it. Um, so I went to a virtual book talk uh, with Kaju Ishiguro and Neil Gaiman, and one thing they talked about was that as we grow, our relationship to media changes because we change. Mm-hmm. And that same night, uh, we watched The Witches, uh, the new one with Anne Hathaway, uh, which is based on a Roald Dahl novel. And I absolutely like was appalled by a lot of things. And then I thought about that novel, uh, which I enjoyed as a child. And I thought, yeah, like um, maybe Roald Dahl wasn't so good with women. And, um, you know, like even though um, he wrote Matilda, um, which maybe I need to evaluate that too. Um, and uh, yeah, I can see why uh, people with limb differences were very upset um, by the portrayal of like the witches in this film. Mm-hmm. And I can see why Anne Hathaway absolutely apologized. And I, I like, you know, I, I don't think that if I were to recommend a book to a child, it would be the witches, honestly. Mm-hmm. And it's because I have changed. Right. When did you read it the first time? Like, yeah, like, hey, exactly. And, and, it- and I, and I've changed since I was 29 and I am sure I will be a, a slightly different person mm-hmm. in two months because that's the hope, right? Like we, that's what aging and growing as a person is. Right. I feel like there should be the more you know kind of star going across, you know, your brain right now. I mean, but I also think Hannah won't judge. So I don't think Hannah will judge a 10 year old who does want to read it in 2021. Right. Like you might not recommend it, but you are a different person at 30 years old in 2021 than you were at 10 years old in you know 2000. Right. Like well, you're a different person. And it becomes like I mean, and, and I think the fact that we like I, I think the, I, the idea of like our relationship to media changes as we change. I, th- I really I really like that way of phrasing it, because I, mean, I think about for me, my, my example is always Ender's Game. Ender's Game was my favorite book as like, you know, an annoying, nerdy 11 year old, because it was the favorite book of many an annoying, nerdy 11 year old. And I remember reading it again in college around the time I was writing my like, like senior, you know, honors thesis or whatever. Boy, I'm nerdy. Oh, <laughs> I ended up writing my senior, my like senior thesis on it because I was basically reading and I was like, good God, I was reading a novel about child soldiers and abuse mm-hmm. that was dressed up as basically really cool laser tag. <laughs> like, and I was just like, how did I not like I had like there were things that gave me the heebie jeebies at 11, but more in the way of like. I remember it more as like in the way that, that a horror novel gives you the heebie-jeebies because like dramatic tension, not like this is a book about traumatizing children. Mm-hmm. And I basically, I mean, that's in some ways how I started studying science fiction because I was like, what bonkers things? Like basically, like how did this escape my eleven-year-old brain? And you were a child. <laughs> well, it's because it was dressed up in a way that yeah. I mean, you know, cool lasers. It, it was, yeah, it was dressed up with cool lasers, and it was it was also I think mean, importantly it was. A story that was very familiar. I mean, in some ways, you could say similar things actually about Star Wars and Jedi and the fact that they're being taken from their families when they're so young and they're being, mm-hmm. you know, trained in the, you know, all these kinds of things, which also, like, I was a kid that was raised around the Star Wars. So to me, like, the idea of, like, the young chosen one in a sci fi or fantasy novel often being a child or an adolescent was, like, completely normal. But, like, and 
but I think also, I mean, Ender's Game, and it became, because especially it was so popular, and it was so problem- like problematic, but, like, it actually became, I, I, you know, many years later, I ended up teaching it in uh, one of my, you know, one of my literature courses, and it was intentionally because I know it's a gross novel in many ways, written by an author that I have all kinds of issues with ethically, but it is also wildly popular. And I basically constructed an entire two weeks in class of like, hey, we're going to talk about this book that probably most of you, because I'm teaching a class full of sci-fi nerds that are uber nerdy, <laughs> where most of them had read the book right. as kids and had a very similar experience to myself, which like ended up being mm-hmm. great because I'm like, great, we're going to spend two weeks talking about how the hell that happens. <laughs> Uh, and a lot, and a lot of people in that class, like they hadn't read it since they were, you know, in middle school or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it ended up being this really interesting conversation about, about, about exactly what Hannah's talking about is like media becomes a way to teach ourselves what, like, and like reflect back on like how, how we've changed. Mm. And like, you haven't even mentioned how problematic the author is, right? Like, oh, which is another issue. Oh uh, yeah. And, <laughs> I mean, but yeah, but I mean, before, we, but before we, episode, guys. Right. Well, we did. Yeah, we did. Like, yeah, we should revisit the milkshake duck thing. But I, and I don't want to go too far off on it because we've gone long. But Wayne, you even said in in our initial blog for this, you know, if if I have to stop reading any comic that Ike Perlmutter is uh, involved with because he is a deplorable human being and he is um, plus all the other people in the comic book industry who are absolutely horrible people. There's some really nice people too, yeah. but there are some people who are super problematic, but there's enough of them. And because Pearl Mutter basically was Marvel comics for the last 25 years, I have no career. Right. Like that's just it. Like I cannot well, function. And it, and it also becomes the cancel culture thing of like, is it better to abdicate from things that are problematic? And as we've said on the show, 10 billion times by now, everything, every, Problem. No, yeah, nothing, sure. nothing yeah. is perfectly good. Uh, well, like, is it, is it, is it, is it better to like abdicate from that cultural phenomenon or is it better to continue to participate in the cultural phenomenon and talk critically about it again, to have that kind of learning experience mm. of like, let's have a critical discussion about all the things that are not great about these things and, and I, I think because i, I think like my job of, yeah and i think some of that boils down to you know your personal levels with any of this stuff as well you know there's stuff right. that we're all going to be comfortable doing that with or, or not mm-hmm. but, but yeah certainly engaging with it critically i think is the the key because it's not going away no well, you, it, if you just it, cancel it, it, it you also don't get to i mean to i think the thing we've been saying this entire episode if you just can't if you just quote unquote cancel it there's no opportunity to reflect on it and actually figure out what what happened that was wrong and right, well, maybe and, do better next time and, we stop growing as people as well. Mm-hmm. Right? So, yeah. So we've resolved nothing. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> we've resolved, about- don't cancel. Don't cancel. Well, like if you're canceling do- things, at least talk think about, about it. it first. Yeah. At least think about it first. <laughs> well, and, and that's it. I mean, there's a legitimacy to saying I am not going to support that business because they engage in business practices. Yes. I find abhorrent. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely yes. fine. I am not going to watch that movie because that person in it said something that I found really offensive. And I just can't support them. I'm not going to buy this guy's albums anymore because he's a douchebag. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think on, on a personal level, those are all legitimate choices. Mm-hmm. You're not out there campaigning that no one else buy those things right. either. Like, I think right. that's where it shifts into the weird territory. Like, this is a different example, and I know we're trying to wrap it up, but, like, there's there's been a push I've seen in a, in a few uh, hobby communities of mine to cancel different, to cancel stores that carry products that are made by people that are toxic. Right. Like, I, you can tell by, like, the way that I have to do the, like, Follow mm-hmm. the bouncing ball of the chain of things. So it's like not canceling the people right. in question, but basically withdrawing business from the people who carry those lines. And I'm like, it's the Cosby problem, right? I, like you were putting out, exactly. how, you're putting out yeah. of work. How many people in order to get to the one billionaire? That, and, <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. Doesn't care. Well, and also these are, I mean, and these are not all very small businesses in, case, yeah, in these yes, cases. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I mean, the other thing is also that on top of that, that I, that was the reason why I bring it up is there were, individuals that were basically campaigning for other people to do the same thing to the point where they were sliding into strangers DMs to basically say, why did you buy X thing from X retailer? And Mm -hmm. then like, to me, there's a difference between informing people of like, Hey, I'm no longer buying from this particular company because of these reasons as a way of like, I'm making this decision based off of this information. Here's some information, do it with you will, as opposed Mm -hmm. to actively going out and basically almost like canceling people who refuse to cancel in the same way you're canceling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which becomes, which I feel like is the thing that cancel culture really at the end of the day kind of is. It's not Mm -hmm. necessarily about canceling the big person. It's 
the infighting that that replaces the nuanced conversation about like, oh, you haven't canceled this person, therefore you're trash because I've drawn a black and white hard line. And anyone who has a complicated response to this issue is clearly, you know, trash person equal to. No, I guess you're you're not canceling this with me, so I'm going to cancel you. Yeah, well, but but I mean that's that conversation. You know, it's funny because I've um I've got into conversations. I know we're wrapping up, but I've got into conversations with people who are people on the left who are offended by the term virtue signaling. Um, because they're like, that's not a thing. It's just something the right made up. No, no, it's a term. It's li- it's literally an academic term. It is a thing, and both sides do it. And I think that cancel culture has become essentially that because you're, you know, are you fighting hard enough to cancel things if you're on one side? And if you're on the other side, are you fighting hard enough against the canceling people? Ted Cruz doesn't give a shit about uh, about to think I saw it all on Mulberry Street. And he doesn't really care about Dr. Seuss, no matter what he says. What he cares about is proving that he is on the side of righteousness by fighting for this thing that doesn't want his help. The Dr. Seuss yeah. people do not care. They're not bringing the book back. It doesn't matter how much money you donate to to Ted Cruz. It doesn't matter how much money you fight, uh, how hard you fight. They do not want to publish a book yeah. and you can't make them. So all, all you're doing is succumbing to his grift. Right. So 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 but but that's the thing now. Right. Like if you're if you are deep into that side, if you really believe in making America great again or whatever the Trump thing line is, then you have to prove it by being on his side. Right. And if you really at some point I'm trying to think complicated person, right? Like how how much do you want to support Harry Potter stuff right now? It's really hard because no matter how hard you try to ignore her. J.K. Rowling really, really, really wants to remind you that she's an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) And and as we pointed out, maybe Harry Potter is not as progressive as perhaps we hope when we were children. Because again, we... But I like it. Because it's the process of like... like And she's making it hard. (laughs) We we grew up and we looked at it and we were like, oh, the things that seemed groovy when I was nine seem less groovy now that I'm 30. That seems like a normal human progression. And then, of course, yeah, she keeps adding on top of that all the time. And I was just growing up when I read it. And also, also Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like, it's, it's, a lot of people have been doing some rethinking of Whedon shows. And that's another topic for another day. Um, Yeah, yeah. So what we've resolved is it's okay to grow. It's okay to grow. So good. Grow. Yeah. Whole body is nerfing. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so this has been That's interesting <laughs> uh, so anyway I guess we should wrap up Drum Hannah where can people find you here <laughs> you can you can go to our blog at voxpopcast.com and leave us comments for future shows Thank you. See, that's, uh, see, that's good. If you don't want to plug something, do the part so I don't have to do all the plugs at the end. There you go. Katya. <laughs> uh, I'm also here. We're at, at Vox Pop cast on all the different social medias. You can, oh, okay. Yeah. I was about to say, you can't both plug the same thing. <laughs> but, yeah, but yes, yes, we've got all of our social medias. And Wayne. I, I think uh, you can come here to find me and leave us a five star review because uh, that, that tweaks the algorithms and makes us happy and Mav won't cry. Oh, yeah. You can even make fun of me like that. Yeah, that's great. Mav. Five star review because that's, that's the review. Five stars. Eugenics bad. Don't let Mav cry. <laughs> that's a good enough review. Actually, that's the one cancel anything I can get behind. Cancel eugenics. Cancel eugenics. Cancel eugenics. That, that I can accept. <laughs> Uh, you should still think about can, why though that, that would have, have like require us to have a hard conversation so <laughs> uh, you can follow me on twitter or instagram or facebook all the places always at chris maverick um yeah follow the show's blog the show vox podcast all at vox podcast all those places and the, the blog wow this is so much easier i don't have to think that hard um <laughs> what else see not but see but now i'm thrown because i don't know what, how to do the yeah. ending of the show iTunes, our on Stitcher. On iTunes, thank you. iTunes, or Stitcher, or Spotify, or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. And you can follow our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is doing great. When you can go on YouTube, you can see visual representations of the show. I don't know that there's going to be really any pictures on this one, but uh, but you know, last week and 
probably next week there might be some interesting stuff so you know f- subscribe to the show on youtube that really helps us out like us like and subscribe and all of those youtube things i would like to thank maximilian of thought Forum music for our epic theme song building ever so more epically and playing us out i'd like to thank you at home for listening and we'll see you next time goodbye Bye. Bye.